my residence at the Cape an interval of upwards of seven months. From the 19th to the 28th of January, when the captain returned from his visit to the governor, Lord Charles Somerset, his countenance sufficiently informed me that he had nothing agreeable to communicate. He was no longer the same man. His behavior was cold and embarrassed, and his reserve was soon imitated by all other persons on board. Several naval officers belonging to different ships in the harbor came to visit their friends on board the Griffin. I could easily perceive that they felt a certain degree of curiosity to see me, though they avoided as much as possible entering into conversation with me. They spoke to each other aside, and by their looks seemed to consider me as an outlaw. From these circumstances and certain expressions that escaped from the persons about me, I could perceive that in spite of the distance, the security of the great captive was the subject of as much alarm and distrust here as at St. Helena, and I had every respect and reason to expect that the dark cloud which enveloped Logwood would be extended over me at the Cape. Accordingly, as soon as I was put on shore at noon, I was met by the officer appointed to guard me, Captain Wright, who took me ashore in his boat for the sake of old acquaintance, and I hope also, from sincere sympathy, declined leaving me until I should be safely lodged in the abode that was destined for me. We therefore walked together to what is called the Old Castle, or Fort after crossing several drawbridges and passing many sentinels we arrived in the inner courtyard or parade and from thence by various staircases and galleries we reached the lodging assigned to us the doors were locked it was necessary to search for the keys and in the meanwhile we were requested to wait in our room which was occupied by several officers of the garrison by chance, an officer of the staff answered. He seemed to be greatly surprised to find we were thus left in free communication with the persons about us, and assuming a polite pretense, he conducted us to his own apartment to partake of some refreshment. After a few hours had elapsed, a messenger was sent to inform us that our apartments were ready. They consisted of three rooms, which we were enabled to discover in proportion as the cloud of dust with which they were filled, gradually dispersed, for they had but that moment been swept. The first room was entirely empty. The middle one contained a large table, an armchair with broken feet, and four other wretched chairs. The third contained two bedsteads, two bolsters, one mattress, and three coverlets. This was the whole of the valuable furniture. It was well that we had taken the precaution to bring our beds with us from St. Helena. I was at a loss to comprehend how two days could have been occupied in such preparations. This circumstance did not afford me a very high notion of the regularity, precision, or promptitude of the new authority under which I was now placed. The officer who had charge of us installed himself in the first room. A sentinel was immediately stationed on the outside, and I was informed that I must not communicate with anyone. I now found myself literally a prisoner. I had complained of Alcombe's cottage, but here I was infinitely worse off. This, thought I, is the first effect of Sir Hudson Lowe's kind recommendations did it was served it was ordered by our officer and was abundant the staff officer who had used the precautionary politeness of conducting us to his apartment in the morning thinking himself already on a footing of intimacy or perhaps being specially charged to watch over us came familiarly to invite me to dinner he and his comrade appeared to exert themselves to do the honors at the table in the most agreeable way they seemed anxious to show me every attention but I did not feel myself at ease, and alleging as an excuse the fatigue I had encountered during the day, I withdrew, leaving them tete-a-tete -tete over the bottle, and they sat until late in the night, according to established custom. On the following day, I received a visit from one of the captains of our station at St. Helena. Knowing the state of my son's health, he brought a medical gentleman along with him. This is a mark of attention on his part, but the introduction occasion for some moments a curious misunderstanding. I mistook the captain's medical friend for his son or nephew. The grave doctor who was presented to me was a boy of 18 with the form, the manners, and the voice of a 
woman. But Mr. Barry, such was his name, was described to be an absolute phenomenon. I was informed that he had obtained his diploma at the age of 13 after the most rigid examination, that he had performed extraordinary cures at the cave and had saved the life of one of the governor's daughters after she had been given up, which rendered him a sort of favorite in the family. I profited by this latter circumstance to obtain some information which might serve as a guide for my conduct with respect to the new governor, to whom I, that day, addressed a letter explaining my situation and formerly requesting to be sent to England and restored to full and complete liberty. My letter was as follows. My lord, having been for several days under your authority, I take the liberty of addressing myself to your excellency in order to ascertain what are your intentions respecting me? Owing to a circumstance of a nature wholly personal to myself, I was removed from Longwood at St. Helena on the 25th of November last by Sir Hudson Lowe, the governor of that island. A few days afterwards, in consequence of several conversations with the governor, though, without his coming to any decision on my case, I wrote to inform him that from that moment I should withdraw my voluntary subjection to him and place myself entirely under the jurisdiction of the laws. I demanded that he would enforce the laws with respect to me, observing that if guilty, I ought to be tried, and if not guilty, I ought to be restored to freedom. I added that the critical state of my son's health and also my own imperiously demanded medical remedies of every kind and I entreated that he would send us to England. Sir Hudson Lowe then seemed to hesitate. I have reason to believe that at first he entertained some idea of sending me to Europe but he next determined to detain me at St. Helena separated from Longwood until the return of answers from England. He then several times offered to allow me to return to Longwood and finally he sent me to the Cape under your excellency's orders thus, as it appears to me, seizing the literal interpretation of his instructions in order to put an end to his embarrassments and perhaps to await the same results respecting me, but without himself risking any personal responsibility. Such, my lord, is the brief statement of facts which I conceive it necessary to submit to you in order that you may form a correct idea of my real situation. I hope you will consider as perfectly natural, inoffensive, and regular the request which I have now the honor to address to you, which is that I may be sent to England as speedily as possible and be restored to full and complete liberty as far as my natural rights may claim consistently with your political duties. P.S. I beg that your excellency will be pleased to inform me whether I may be allowed to write to his royal highness the prince regent and his ministers. If that permission be granted, I shall do myself the honor of addressing to your excellency two letters with the request that you will forward them to England without delay. I shall also be obliged if you will let me know when there is an opportunity of communicating with St. Helena as I have to address some papers to Sir Hudson Lowe. Two days afterwards, I received the governor's answer. It was very brief without entering into any particulars. He merely declared that he considered me as a prisoner on the report of Sir Hudson Lowe and condemn me to remain at the Cape until instructions arrived from England. I could make no resistance. I was compelled to submit. This I intimated to Lord Charles Somerset in a second letter in which I enclosed two others. The first addressed to Lord Castlereagh, requesting his lordship to lay the second before the Prince Regent. My letter to Lord Charles Somerset was as follows. My lord, I have received the answer which your excellency addressed to me and from which I learn that I am to be detained a prisoner here until Sir Hudson Lowe shall receive answers from England respecting me. Doubtless your excellency has in your wisdom accurately weighed the force of reasons which induce you to adopt a measure of so serious a nature as that of depriving me of my liberty without any previous judicial forms and even without my being made acquainted with the cause of my detention all I can do is submit to authority and to rely on those laws which will protect me if I be entitled to protection, I shall not undertake any ulterior argument for my defense, being persuaded that you, my lord, in the justice of your heart, when you determine on adopting so delicate a course, must have attentively considered the whole of my case. 
However, I perceive from your answer that your decision rests on circumstances stated respecting me by Sir Hudson Lowe. But have these circumstances been satisfactorily proved in your excellency's eyes? Have you heard both sides of the question? Or do you think yourself screened from all personal responsibility by acting on the authority of Sir Hudson Lowe's instructions and without any regard to my remonstrances? How happens it that Sir Hudson Lowe could not venture without risk to detain me at St. Helena while he finds it more easy and less inconvenient to do so at the Cape? If your excellency should wish to render yourself acquainted with my affair and to ascertain my sentiments, I am ready to submit to your perusal all my correspondence with the governor of St. Helena and to lay before you my letters to His Royal Highness the Prince Regent and his ministers. I make this offer with the request that it may be accepted if to subject myself voluntarily on my arrival in England to any measures, however arbitrary, which might be deemed equivalent to my political quarantine here would induce you to alter your determination. I am ready to accede willingly to that condition, such as my ardent desire to return to Europe, owing to the state of my son's health and my own, and also an account of the melancholy solitude in which I find myself placed, separated as I am from my family, which is most dear to me, and from the revered object for whose sake I made the sad sacrifice of leaving my country. Finally, my lord, if there remain no chance of my liberation, at least permit my son to depart. Let him not fall a victim to circumstances to which his age must render him wholly a stranger. I willingly consent to see him separated from me in the hope of securing to him a happier lot than which seems to be reserved for me. I will remain here alone to struggle with my infirmities and sorrows to which I shall resign myself with the greater indifference when I reflect that my child is released from the sentence of lingering death which is executing on me, though I have been tried by no tribunal and condemned by no judge. I have the honor to address to your excellency a letter to Lord Castlereagh, enclosing one for his royal highness the Prince Regent, these letters were written before I received the information which you had the goodness to communicate to me on this subject. I know not to which of the ministers I ought to have addressed myself, but I consider it unnecessary to write the letter over again, as the state of my eyes renders writing a very painful task, and I find that I have observed the necessary forms. Letter to Lord Castlereagh in closing that address to the Prince Regent. My Lord, as I know not to which of your colleagues I ought to appeal, I address myself to you, being the individual of whom I have acquired the greatest knowledge through public events. If the details relating to St. Helena have been communicated to your lordship, they must doubtless have inspired you with great prejudice against me. And yet, had they been properly explained... My conduct must have appeared to you worthy of esteem and perhaps even have excited your interest. At long, when I considered myself within a sacred boundary of which it was my duty to defend the approaches, I would willingly have died on that breach. I resisted. But now, when I find myself removed from the revered circle and again mingling with the common mass, I assume another attitude. I implore, I therefore beg you to treat my lord. And I speak in the supposition that I am addressing the minister to whom this appeal ought to be directed. I entreat that you will allow me to proceed to England since the alarming state of my son's health and my own renders skillful and prop medical treatment necessary. What reason can there be for refusing my request? It cannot be personal hatred. I am too obscure to attain such an honor. It cannot be the vague dislike arising from difference of opinion. You are so much accustomed to difference of this kind in England, and it is cherished with so little rancor that it would be ridiculous to suppose such a circumstance could operate to my prejudice? Can it be the fear that I should write or speak on the affairs of St. Helena? But would not your refusal to grant my request in some measure authorize the bitterness which it will be so easy to vent elsewhere? Besides, if your object were to restrain me from publishing... My residence in England would surely render this object the more secure and easy, for there you have not only general laws, but also particular laws 
against such offenses. When the individual is near you, you have as positive guarantees his prudence, his judgment, and above all, his wish of remaining in the country. Thus, my lord, I see no motive for refusing my request, but I see many reasons for granting it. You would by this means have the fairest opportunity of arriving at the truth by procuring contradictory and opposite statements in discharging the noble functions of a juror. Can you satisfy your conscience by viewing only one side of the question? I can show you the other, and I will do so without prejudice or passion. You will find that I am inspired only by sentiment. I must now call your lordship's attention to my papers, which are detained at St. Helena. I have several times explained the nature, but I will once more describe them. They are a collection of manuscripts in the form of a journal in which, for the space of 18 months, I inscribed all that I learned, saw, or heard respecting him, who in my eyes is and will ever continue to be the greatest of men. This journal, which was incomplete, incorrect, unarranged, and from its nature requiring continual correction, was a secret, which was revealed only by the circumstances that took place previously to my departure from St. Helena. Its existence was unknown, except perhaps by the august individual who was the object of its contents. It was not destined to be published during my life, and I took pleasure in endeavoring to render it a complete and valuable historical monument. My lord, I beg that you will order the whole of those papers to be forwarded to you, that you may do without inconvenience. I solemnly protest that they contain nothing that can either directly or indirectly be necessary or useful to the local authority of St. Helena in furtherance of the great object with which that authority is entrusted. The inspection of my papers at St. Helena can be protective of no advantage, but on the contrary, may continue serious inconvenience by aggravating through the personal illusions contained in them the ill humor and irritation that already prevail in too great a degree. If, on my arrival in England, your lordship from your political situation should think proper to order the examination of these papers, which are of so sacred and private in nature, I shall cheerfully submit to your judgment because the examination will take place under my own cognizance, and I shall have the security of those inviolable and sacred forms, which I am sure your lordship will direct to be absurd. I trust you will not refuse the second favor, which I urgently solicit. My lord, I have the honor to forward to you a letter for the Prince Regent, which I beg you will do me the favor to lay before his his royal highness my profound respect for his august person alone prevents me from sending it unsealed and i authorize your lordship to open it if custom admits of your doing so Letter to the Prince Regent of England. Royal Highness, the sport of the political tempest, wandering without a home, an unfortunate foreigner presumes confidently to appeal to your royal heart. Twice in the course of my life, I have had the misfortune to leave my country on both occasions contrary to my interests and with the intention of fulfilling great and noble duties. During my first exile, my abode in England assuaged the sorrows of my youth, and I trusted that England would again afford me an asylum in which I might enjoy a little tranquility in my old age. However, I have reason to apprehend that I shall be driven from thence. Why should I be visited with this severity? Can it be an account of the place from whence I came, the attentions which I took pleasure in admitted ministering there, and the tenor sentiments which I shall ever entertain towards the individual from whom I am now separated? But Prince, at long, I was practicing a great and singular virtue. I was supporting with my worthy companions the honor of those who surround the thrones of monarchs. After the example we have presented, it cannot henceforth be said that love and fidelity are never shown to unfortunate sovereigns. Should such conduct occasion me to be persecuted and banished from the asylum I seek, surely he who was always great when the race for me from the rock of adversity, these words so gratifying to my heart, whether you return to France or go elsewhere, always boast of the fidelity you've shown me. Surely he, I say, has given me a right and title to the regard of all kings, Prince, I throw myself 
on your royal protection. During my daily intercourse and conversations with him, who once ruled the world and filled the universe with his name, I conceived and executed the intention of writing down daily all that I saw of him and all that I heard him say. This journal, which includes an interval of 18 months and which is single in its kind, but as yet incomplete, incorrect, and determined, and unknown to all, even the august individual to whom it related, has been taken from me and detained at St. Helena. Prince, I also place it under your royal protection, and I venture to entreat that you will receive it into your care for the sake of justice, truth, and history. If your highness should, in your goodness, deign to afford me your august protection, I shall hasten to seek in England an asylum where I may tranquilly recollect and deplore countless causes. I received an answer from Lord Charles Somerset to permission I had solicited for my son to proceed to Europe by the first opportunity. I wished my son to avail himself of this permission. I urged and even commanded him to do so, but he positively refused. On this subject, he wrote a letter to the governor, which was so gratifying to my feelings and reflected so much honor in his own heart that I cannot forbear transcribing it. It was as follows. My lord, my father has just communicated to me the permission you grant me to return to Europe. He has entreated and commanded me to accept it. I cannot, my lord, avail myself of your indulgence, and I presume to disobey my father. Bodily afflictions are nothing. The suffering of the heart alone are hard to be endured. I have been deprived of my mother, and I every moment deplore my separation from her. Yet I will never forsake my father in a foreign country and in a situation so different from all that he has been accustomed to. My health is an object of no importance to me. I shall be happy if I can afford any consolation to my father and alleviate by sharing the miseries which have long been accumulating upon him. I prefer dying by his side to living at a distance from him. I am too proud of his distinguished virtues and too eager to imitate his example to separate from him for a moment. I am ready to die here since it must be so. There will be two victims instead of one. I thank you, my lord, with all my heart for your kind intentions respecting me. How grateful should I have been? How should I have blessed you had you extended them to my father? This letter had doubtless been read by the family of Lord Charles Somerset and produced those favorable sentiments which it was naturally calculated to inspire. On the following day, when the young doctor called to see us, I wished to draw him aside for the purpose of requesting that he would exert his professional influence over my son to induce him to depart. But instead of listening to me, he hastened to Emmanuel's chamber and embracing him expressed his approval of his conduct, observing that he should not have respected him had he acted otherwise. Conducting him to the window, he introduced him to two ladies whom he had left in their carriage and mutual salutation passed between them. These ladies were the two daughters of Lord Charles Somerset who had this morning themselves brought the doctor as far as the courtyard fronting our prison, probably for the purpose of satisfying the interest and curiosity which my son's letter had excited. Our situation continued to be the most deplorable. We were confined in a sort of dungeon. Our windows without curtains overlooked a courtyard covered with scorching sand. Though it was now the month of January we experienced in this hemisphere, the burning heat of summer. We were almost suffocated. We were still subject to the same restrictions and the same vexations and the same officers presided at breakfast and dinner this last circumstance was a particular annoyance to me i determined to avoid it and i therefore kept my bed and had my meal served to me there being determined not to leave my chamber until i should be released from the torments that surrounded me i was besides very unwell from pains in my stomach i was occasionally feverish and in short my health was totally deranged the officer on duty informed me it is true that he had orders to conduct me into the town and even the environs whenever i should express a wish to that effect i thanked him and though i could not myself profit by this favor i accepted it for my son meanwhile nobody came near me whether it was that the officer, knowing me to be unwell, thought he was rendering me service, or whether he was acting in conformity with orders, I know not. But he repulsed all who attempted to approach me. 
This gave rise to a curious circumstance. Our chamber door led into a corridor along which we were permitted to walk. Having one day proceeded to the end of it, I found, contrary to custom, a little door open leading to a steep staircase. Curiosity induced me to ascend, and I found myself on the platform of the fort whence I could command a view of Cape Town and the boundless sea. Struck with the beauty of the spectacle, I became so wrapped in the meditations to which it gave rise that two hours elapsed ere I thought of returning. By chance, I had come out while my son was taking a walk with our officer in the interim. The sentinel had been changed, and when I presented myself at the door leading to our apartment, the soldier placed his musket across it and rudely refused to admit me. The more I insisted on being admitted, the more angrily he expressed his determination to exclude me. This appeared to me odd enough, but... I thought it still more droll when I found it necessary to descend the staircase, pass through the courtyard to the outward guardhouse, and obtain entrance to my prison by main force. The officer on duty, alarmed at the sight of me, ran furiously to the sentinel who was posted on the outside of our apartments, and a violent altercation ensued between them. The officer severely reprimanded the man and threatened to have him punished. The soldier, with his eyes starting out of his head, declared that he had discharged his duty. And I, who remained a tranquil spectator, could not forbear smiling at this curious dispute, the cause of which no one could explain but myself. However, peace was soon established at the expense of the captain. I was again placed under confinement and... Order was restored in the fort. The only stranger I saw was Dr. Barry, who frequently visited me. I found his company very agreeable. He constantly recommended me to take care of my health. He said that he could guess the seat of my disorder and regretted that it was out of his power to prescribe any remedy for me. I assured him that the greatest favor he could confer on me would be to procure a person who could read to me and write to my dictation. This I had been vainly soliciting since my arrival, for the state of my eyes precluded all occupation, and my son was strictly desired to abstain from all sedentary employment. I therefore labored under an intolerable depression of spirits, and being thus wholly abandoned to my melancholy thoughts. The doctor informed me that the governor was about to depart to make a tour over the colony, and that he would be absent for about three months. This information precluded the hope of any change in my condition i determined to make a last attempt not that i counted on its success but only because i wished to leave nothing untried for the horrible and truly discourteous way in which i had been treated astonished me less than it was calculated to do. I was prepared for it. At St. Helena, we had been repeatedly informed that Lord Charles Somerset was our personal enemy. And on my arrival at the Cape, when I made inquiries respecting his character and the sort of reception I was likely to experience, I was told that nothing but a dog or a horse could claim his attention. Subsequently, in the solitude of my prison, I often thought to myself that being neither a dog nor a horse, I might despair of obtaining any notice from the governor. I shall soon show how little Lord Charles Somerset deserved these reflections, profiting by a passage in his letter in which he expressed a wish to render my stay at the Cape as agreeable as possible. I took the opportunity in my next letter to candidly communicate to him my thoughts respecting the treatment I experienced. My letter was as follows. My lord, I learned that your excellency is on the eve of leaving Cape Town and that you will be absent for a considerable time. This induces me with extreme repugnance to enter upon a disagreeable subject and to call your excellency's attention to a few domestic details. I think it my duty to do this for otherwise should any public expression of dissatisfaction here ever escape me. I might justly incur the reproach of having addressed no complaint to your excellency. But before I enter on this subject, my lord, to prevent you from regarding as ridiculous the facts which I am about to state and also to afford you a just idea of the circumstances in which I am placed, of which I think it very probable your excellency is ignorant, permit me to observe with all the embarrassment of one who is obliged to introduce himself that there is no individual here with whom I may not and ought not naturally and without reserve to place myself on a level in every respect, whatever. Finally, 
I neither request nor solicit any indulgence or favor relative to my personal wants, wishing this respect to depend entirely on my own resources. These two points being fixed and determined, I proceed to that passage in your letter in which you have the goodness to express your wish of rendering my stay here as agreeable as possible. On this subject, I must acquaint your excellency that I'm imprisoned in a kind of dungeon in which it will be difficult for me much longer to support existence. My son and I, who are both unwell, are in this extremely hot weather, lodged in a very small chamber where we breathe unwholesome air and have scarcely room to move. For our beds nearly fill it. The scorching rays of the sun reflect on a window without curtains, compel me to pass the day in bed. There is, it is true, another adjoining apartment of the same kind, but it is a dining room where two of your officers do the honors of the table. If I occasionally enter this room, I count every moment I spend in it. There is a third room, which is occupied by the officer who is appointed as our guard and through which I must pass, however unpleasant to me, on every indispensable occasion. Whatever may be the hardships and miseries of such a situation, I have been a sailor, I have been a soldier, and what is more, I am a man, and I can in silence endure this and even more. I speak here only in answer to the obliging paragraph in your letter. There is no fire in our apartments, so that if we should require warm water on account of my son's health or any transient wants, we must either do without or have recourse to the charity of our neighbors. The doctor has in vain prescribed the use of the bath for my son. No water can be obtained for this purpose. If I feel a wish to procure any little thing at my own expense, I am informed that your excellency has ordered everything to be provided for me. And thus, from motives of delicacy, I repress my wish and abstain from gratifying it. I spare your excellency a multitude of details which are equally beneath your notice and mine. When the hour of dinner arrives, two officers who I feel pleasure in acknowledging treat me with great politeness and respect to preside at the table, but it is a singular fact, though a very certain one, that even their attentions add to my discomfort by obliging me to endeavor to return them in a suitable way, though it would be far more natural and desirable for me to allow my thoughts to wander far from the spot in which I am now situated. Besides, our habits and manners are totally different. I find myself under the necessity of sitting for several hours at table when I should not from choice sit for half an hour. All conversation must be disagreeable to me unless it be on the subject which now wholly occupies my thoughts. Your Excellency has too much judgment not to perceive that the situation in which I am placed is an absolute torment to me. My melancholy is doubtless as irksome to my table companions as their gaiety is annoying to me. Perfect solitude is alone agreeable to me, and therefore I have completely withdrawn from the dinner table, and I take my meals in bed. Where is the necessity for an officer being attached to my person? Sin. I presume to ask your excellency this question, while at the same time I repeat with pleasure that I cannot sufficiently express my satisfaction of the individual whom you have appointed to attend me. Is it for the purpose of watching me? Surely the sentinel posted at my door is sufficient for that purpose. Can it be intended as a mark of respect for the sake of transferring any wish that I may express? But I have no wish. Can it be to give the sanction of authority to any visits I may receive? I can receive none except such as are permitted by authority. Is it for the purposes of accompanying me in my walks? I will never consent to stir a step if I must be a charge to an officer. I shall not therefore go abroad, since, my lord, you are determined that I shall remain your prisoner. What objection can you have to placing me in a house in the town and permitting me to engage at my own expense any valet cook that may suit me with the precautions that you may think proper to adopt when thus left to myself? Your Excellency might provide as you pleased for my security, you would hear no more of me. If I felt a wish to go out in a carriage or otherwise, I could write to the officer. I know his obliging disposition, and my wish would be granted. I have mentioned a house in the town, my lord, because the state of my son's health, which requires constant and often sudden medical attendance, 
renders a residence in the country objectionable. Such are the details to which I feel myself compelled to call your excellency's attention. I hope that they may be less disagreeable and painful to you than they are to me. This letter was, from its nature, calculated to lead to a decisive result. I received an immediate answer. The adjutant general came to inform me in the name of the governor first that he had given orders that a separate chamber should be assigned to my son on the following day. Second, that the officers should no longer take their meals with us. Third, that a more convenient residence was preparing for us. And finally, that if I had any other wish to express, endeavors would be made to comply with it. Such was the effect of my letter. It was successful beyond my hopes, and I congratulated myself on having written it because it afforded me the opportunity of discovering traits in the character of Lord Charles Somerset, of which I had previously no idea. But this was not all. Early on the following morning, the governor's first aide-de-camp wrote to acquaint me that he had a communication to make to me on the part of His Excellency, and he wished me to appoint the hour at which it would be convenient for me to receive him. On the receipt of my answer, he came and informed me that the governor had that morning left town to make a tour of three months. His Excellency had expressed himself very sorry to learn that I had been so exceedingly unwell and begged that I would do him the justice to believe that he was entirely ignorant of the fact. The aide-de-camp was instructed to tell me that Lord Charles Somerset had nothing more at heart than to render my abode at the Cape as agreeable as it could be, and he offered me the use of his country residence, the servants, and everything belonging to it. He begged that I would take possession of it, repeating that if I had any other wish, I need only name it, and it would be complied with. I accepted without hesitation the offer of the change of residence, and the aide-de-camp went to give the necessary orders for our immediate removal." I now discovered how greatly the governor's character had been misrepresented to me. I found that Lord Charles Somerset possessed the grace and courtesy of manners requisite for his high rank. How much men differ from one to another. St. Helena, such a letter as I had written would probably have had the effect of doubly riveting my chains, but here procured for me the offer of a palace. This fact is in itself sufficient to characterize the two authorities with whom I have had to treat. Lord Charles Somerset was indeed far from meriting the reports I had heard respecting him. Almost every man has his detractors, and those who have high functions to discharge seldom escape the tongue of calumny. Lord Charles as I had subsequently the opportunity of ascertaining, is a man distinguished for noble and generous feeling, moral principle, piety, and perfect benevolence. None of the vexations by which I had been so greatly harassed proceeded from him, but from subordinate agents who executed orders and influenced decisions for the persons in authority here who were the slaves of vulgar national prejudice, hated us as Frenchmen, and esteemed themselves happy in subjecting to all the severity which it was in their power to inflict. If I had enjoyed the advantage of personal intercourse with the governor, in which I have reason to believe there would have been no difficulty, I doubt not that in pleading my cause with Lord Charles Somerset, I should have obtained all I demanded because my demands were perfectly just. But my situation withheld me from seeking access to him, and it seemed to be the wish of those about him to prevent him coming near me. He several times announced his intention of seeing me, it is true, but this intention was never fulfilled.